Although people tend to think that the choices they make every day are conscious decisions, the majority of the actions they take are actually led by habits. As the recent movement of understanding human and organizational habits has exploded, so has our interest in trying to understand how we can get rid of our own bad habits and adopt better, healthier ones. The power of habit explores individual stories and the stories happening in organizations to see how habits have influenced their success, all the while weaving in research that shows us just how complex habits are. Though habits vary widely from person to person and from organization to organization, Charles Dewey gives us great insight into the factors that influence people and organizations as they form new habits and gives a fascinating insight into how they've successfully changed old habits. What are habits and how do they work? In the early 90 seconds, admit, researchers started examining a part of the brain to see if it was related to habit, the basal ganglia. They conducted a study where rats were placed in a T-shaped maze behind a gate, and chocolate was placed at the other end of the maze. The rats couldn't see the chocolate, so once the gate opened with a clicking sound, they had to go forward and make a turn to get their chocolatey reward. This study revealed a concept called the reward loop. As the rats went through the maze time and time again, scientists could see a habit loop forming. The reward loop has three parts. For the rats, it started with a cue or trigger, the clicking gate, then the brain went into an automatic routine, and then there was a reward, the chocolate, which is how the rats' brains determined that the whole routine was worth learning. They also monitored the rat's brain activity and saw that, as the habit developed and grew stronger, their mental activity actually decreased. This demonstrates why habits exist. They allow the brain to relax. Habits are powerful, influencing the way we act, often without us even noticing. Only by paying close attention and learning to notice the cues and rewards our habits rely on, can we learn to change the routine. Claude Hopkins became well-known in marketing for his explanation of how to create new consumer habits. His rules became widespread in the world of business, educational reform, and even among politicians. When his friend came to him, asking him to help sell a toothpaste called Pepsodent, Hopkins was skeptical. But once he agreed, and Pepsodent became a hit, making toothbrushing a popular new international habit, Hopkins would claim that he found a particular cue and reward and fueled a particular habit. He explained that beautiful teeth and a pretty smile was the reward. The routine, brushing your teeth with Pepsodent. Once people started using Pepsodent, they started craving the feeling they got, the cool, tingling sensation that Pepsodent gave them. That signaled the consumers that the toothpaste really works, so they began to anticipate that feeling. That sensation was the craving that drove the Pepsodent habit loop. We begin to anticipate the reward, to crave it. That's what motivates us to form a new habit. Alcoa, the aluminum company of America, was not having a great year. Their management was making mistakes, and their new product lines weren't working out. Then, a new CEO came on board, Paul O'Neill. He had a lot of experience in transforming organizational habits. He knew that by attacking one habit other positive changes would occur naturally in the organization. These central habits are called keystone habits. These are the habits that have the power to transform an entire organization over time. Nearly every organization has institutional habits, or routines, according to researchers. Sometimes they encourage success, and sometimes failure. O'Neill got all employees involved in reporting accidents. He also got them involved in suggesting ways to prevent those types of accidents from happening again. He shared even minor improvements with the entire company. These small wins made employees proud and gave them an incentive to keep contributing and improving. Keystone habits apply to families and individuals too. There have been studies that have shown families who regularly have dinner together raise children with higher grades, more confidence, and higher emotional control. In a way, these initial habits seem to start a domino effect, helping people develop other good habits. A study on willpower in children showed that those students with the most willpower actually had better grades in school and did fewer drugs. Scientists have shown that when people have self-regulatory skills, they have an advantage in many areas of their lives. Studies have also shown that willpower can be worn down. It's not just a skill, it's more like a muscle. If our willpower is tested at one moment, there's less of it to go around in the next moment. Australian scientists, Megan Oten and Ken Cheng wanted to know if these muscles of willpower could be exercised and strengthened. They first conducted a study to see whether more frequent exercise, which requires willpower, would have an effect in other areas of the participants' lives. It did. So, what keeps willpower from lapsing? It turns out that employees and individuals have great success when they envision and plan for lapses. If people plan on what to do when they experience difficult moments, whether it's how to react to an impatient customer at Starbucks or knowing what we'll do to get to the gym after a particularly hard day at work, they are more likely to succeed. Some organizations have habits that are destructive. Maybe it's when leaders have a so-called power trip or departments are told to mind their own business. Consider the Rhode Island Hospital. Surgeons did not want to hear input from nurses who were asking for a timeout period to discuss their plan with the patients. Huge, expensive mistakes were made, like a surgeon operating on the wrong side of a patient's brain, or another one removing the tonsils of a girl who was meant to have eye surgery. After several errors, the hospital found itself in crisis mode. Only then were the surgeons open to creating change and implement the nurse's idea of a timeout. 
Now it's a hospital with a sparkling reputation, and that's why sometimes a crisis can be a moment that organizations shouldn't waste. In fact, some institutional leaders even try to turn a problem into a perceived crisis or create a greater sense of urgency in order to get people concerned and take the opportunity to create change. It certainly happens in governments worldwide. Once upon a time, organizations tried to understand customers by consulting with psychologists and making sweeping generalizations. Today they have data. Retail organizations have conducted countless studies to try and better understand why people shop the way they do. And they realize that habits rule all. The only problem is that everyone's habits are different. But now retailers have masses of data on their hands. Data has become a huge business, and it's essentially the only way companies can get an edge today. If customers' habits have a significant impact on the way they shop, certain milestones in life really present an opportunity to change those habits. Marriage, a new home, divorce, and pregnancy are absolute gold mines. But there is a fine line between knowing the important moments and using them to your marketing advantage and crossing the line and making people uncomfortable. So, what's the trick to making such offers more tolerable? By putting them among other things that appear random or familiar. Social movement happens with the power of social connections and persuasion. Rosa Parks is another central figure in the movement. She wasn't the first person to be arrested for breaking the bus segregation laws, but she was the first with a lot of social power. Parks was a beloved member of a lot of different community groups. She volunteered, and she befriended people of all kinds, from farmers to professors. So, when people heard of her arrest and the idea to hold a bus boycott, they were willing to help the woman they respected so well. Studies show that if something bad happens to a stranger, people don't have a problem ignoring it. However, when something happens to a friend, there's a distinct feeling of anger. Through this social peer pressure, strong Thai friendships moved into action. Then, eventually, so many people were involved that weak Thai influences also came into play. This means that someone who had never even met Rosa Parks joined the boycott because so many other people in their community, like neighborhood communities and churches, were doing the same. Under the leadership of Martin Luther King, Jr., social relationships and pressures were also how the civil rights movement remained a peaceful, non-violent affair. People observed the behavior of others and learned to do the same, even as the movement spread to new cities and states. Why do we say that someone with gambling or drug addiction is at fault? Or they should have done better? Gambling can start out as an innocent activity from time to time. It was a little window of excitement once in a while for Angie Bachman. But as her emotions got tied in, it became an emotional release. With casinos pressuring her and showering her with irresistible offers, she kept going back a little more frequently. She even tried to move to a non-gambling state and the casino lured her back with free flights and comp rooms. Ms. Bachman, the gambling addict, was just following deeply ingrained habits that made it increasingly difficult for decision-making to intervene. But the gambler is held accountable for her actions. Ms. Bachman knew about her addiction. She tried to quit once. Once you're aware of a bad habit, you have the responsibility to change it. She could have tried harder. There is no denying that habits are complex. We all have hundreds of habits that influence our behavior every day. However, once we are aware of a potentially dangerous or bad habit and understand that the habit can change, it's our responsibility to change it. Then, only once we recognize a habit and believe we can make a change, can the change really happen. There is a golden rule of habit change and that is, you can't get rid of a bad habit. You can only change it. To do this you keep the old cue and the old reward but you change the routine. Interestingly, belief is a key principle that has made Alcoholics Anonymous a famous, widely studied organization. They help alcoholics use the same cues and get the same reward but shifting the routine of reaching for alcohol to a different one. Having a group who believes in the same thing is so crucial in habit change. It's why A and other similar groups are so successful. It's also why finding a social group who eat healthily can help boost your success in doing the same. Consider the case of Target, a major retailer, who turned to their statisticians to ask if they can predict when women were pregnant before it was public knowledge, and they were signing up for moms-only mailing lists and maternity specials. All retailers could easily track when customers have had a child, based on diaper and wipes purchases, among other things. But if Target could see when women were most likely pregnant before other retailers could, they'd have the upper hand. But would women like it if the organization started insinuating they were pregnant? Would it show that companies know too much? The short answer is yes. Through testing, they found out that some women reacted badly. One teenage girl's father was also furious to see the retailer was sending his daughter deals on pregnancy-related goods, at least before he found out she was pregnant. With Target, they were able to reach pregnant women without making them feel uncomfortable by mixing in some pregnancy-related products with other things like dishes and home care products. In that way, no one suspected that Target knew too much. Yet the new form of advertising really worked and brought a huge profit boost to the retailer. 